Great, perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much to uh, Cynthia and to Krishna and just to all of you for helping to coordinate it. I really appreciate it and I'm super excited to be here with all of you. So today is going to be a story in kind of two parts about this journey to DevOps and to the DevOps world. Um, so one of the jokes in uh, DevOps is that when you go into DevOps, you really just become a YAML engineer. <laughs> so this is just a little bit um, about myself and the things that I'm into, just making things uh, a garden. And that is uh, my little baby, Orion. So from here, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, so the first part of this, Act 1, is going to be sort of reflecting on the past. So um, there's going to be a lot of nostalgia here. Uh, and there's also going to be some kind of gratuitous use of charts because uh, I am kind of fun throwing a bunch of charts into this presentation. So I wanted to start a little bit with, uh, you know, stepping way back into history, looking at some moments in cloud history. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this, but you can see this time frame here is like roughly 45 years. Um, starting going from, you know, the early days of computing all the way through you know, the internet officially launching in 1991. And then right here towards the end of it, you see um, the cloud where Amazon first uh, launches their public cloud. Um, so next from here, uh, you can see this is a much shorter time frame, And this is just in the last 15 years that things have really started to happen in this world of cloud, like the ideas about cloud and DevOps and so on. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, things like Git didn't come out till 2005, GitHub in 2008, um, Kubernetes in 2014. So a lot of the things that I do on a regular basis now, a lot of the technologies that the tech world is super crazy about have only really come about in kind of these really recent times. Um, you know, Amazon Web Services in 2006, 2008 for Google Cloud, you know, and compute. Um, and a lot of these things now that we're using um, have just slowly started to rise in popularity in, in the recent years. Um, so I wanted to throw a little blurb about this. These are some women that uh, you all might have seen and heard before, just some of the pioneers of computing. But um, one thing I really wanted to highlight is just even throughout a lot of history, you have women like Ada Lovelace, um, you know, who is kind of the the progenitor, like a lot of computing, like well known as, you know, maybe the first programmer out there, Grace Hopper, uh, who has been credited as starting the first compiler, which she really did in her free time. Um, and Hedy Lamarr, who was, in addition to being a movie star, you know, her early inventions would lead to the inventions and patents on things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but this is just sort of a quick scroll of just the history of women in computing. There have been all of these really amazing accomplishments, um, all of these moments, everything from code breaking through World War II, all the way up through um, the early days um, pre-internet, where women had a really strong impact on just technology and computing in general. Um, so from here, I'm going to dial back down into uh, my world and talk a little bit about my journey to DevOps in the cloud. Um, and how this kind of started, how I ended up falling into tech, and my progression from this world of, um, you know, starting in tech and then this IT operations and systems administration world, um, all the way through learning just what this cloud is all about, and, uh, uh, and then DevOps from there. Um, so, uh, in the beginning, you know, I, uh, I thought, since, as you can see here, when I was a child, I, for some reason, had really linked into this idea that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon and I was going to go to med school. So, um, so I ended up going to Berkeley. I was double majoring in English and uh, in biology because I figured, you know, I might as well explore and learn. Uh, but as I went through, uh, yeah, I realized, you know what, I don't think this is where I want to be. This is not what I'm excited about or interested in um, or where I want to be for you know pretty much the rest of my working life. So what happened is I ended up falling accidentally into technology. I got an internship uh, basically doing QA black box testing at a startup while um, I was up at school. Um, you know I would take uh, BART into San Francisco and it was all of the stuff that you imagine from startup life. You had 
the video game console in the basement. We had, you know, fancy cappuccino machines uh, and just a lot of people doing really interesting things that were all super excited about what they were doing. Uh, you know, I learned a lot. Uh, I had to have one of the senior engineers come over and say, yeah, you should take that password off the post-it on your monitor. Uh, and the first time that I said Linux instead of Linux, uh, you could hear the entire room go quiet. So I definitely learned a lot, but I also learned a lot of really great and interesting things um, because, you know, even then, uh, all of their systems were probably in a combo of a data center or on some computer under some guy's desk, but they had this system where there was a development environment and a QA and a staging and prod. There was uh, a lot of testing throughout the life cycle. It was kind of everything that uh, now looking back, you would want to see out of software development. Um, and at the time, that was just what was normal. That was what I thought, you know, all environments should be like. You know, things were rarely on fire because everything was really tested thoroughly before it got rolled out. Um, maybe once in a while there would be some bug that we would have to, um, you know, do a crazy fix on. But for the most part, things were pretty stable. And, you know, I just thought that was normal. So coming out of that, uh, I ended up going the certification bootcamp life. And then from there, ended up at um, a boutique consulting provider. So uh, this is a different kind of cloud here, the word cloud where as a consultant at this uh, provider, we basically took care of kind of everything, including the kitchen sink. So if that included, um, you know, your IT services, your software development, uh, you know, your cabling, your network, your, um, you know, internet services and so on, we, we sort of covered the range. And so from there, I started kind of doing a lot of IT technician support but also kind of growing to really go in and start working with the customers and um, doing a lot of like systems administration, uh, operations being out in the field. Um, and the other thing, uh, as you can see here, you know, your tech support chart. Um, but the other thing that we had that I thought was really interesting was um, basically we had a set of hosting services. And this was, like I mentioned, pre-cloud. Uh, so uh, we just made do with the things that we had uh, there was basically a closet inside that office that had a collection of servers that were running, you know, everything from DNS to web servers um, to, you know, we had Tomcat and QMail and a uh, collection of just different small businesses in one size, but also some pretty large ones. Um, but a lot of this stuff was all managed um, in a manual way because we didn't have the automation tools that are out there now. Um, a lot of what we did, though, was templatized through processes and through manual scripts because that was what we had access to at the time. So from there, I went into the freelance consulting world, basically doing roughly the same thing, working on a mix of pretty much every kind of project under the sun, but uh, just on my own. Um, so after doing that for a while, just looking at really interesting solutions, working on uh, a variety of different projects, I landed at a manufacturing company as IT manager. And so as a small business, what that meant is you kind of take care of a little bit of everything. Um, but it was also very much this on-premise world. Uh, you know, we had a data center, everything was on exchange. We took care of all of our own network and so on. Um, you know, maybe had a couple outsourced projects here and there. And there where we started to do some web development and I worked with these outside teams, I started to hear more and more about things like you know, cloud, like people storing things and using functions and um, accessing buckets and starting to move little parts and pieces of our infrastructure out into the cloud. And I thought that was all really interesting and exciting. And from there, going to uh, just different events in the community, I started to learn more and more about a lot of these technologies. But um, based on our infra, this company it was really hard to work on and implement that. Um, they weren't kind of at the place to be able to move forward. It was sort of a lot more slow moving and a lot more static as far as uh, the tech that we were using. Um, so from there, after being there for several years, uh, I ended up sort of switching from this model of just being in this sort of systems administration, IT operations, to more of the application development and DevOps engineering world and started to be able to work with a lot of really, really interesting technology from there. 
Uh, so it was kind of a mix of some systems admin, but also site reliability engineering, um, build and release, cloud engineering, um, some development and scripting and so on. And this oh. is sort of a collection of these different tools. Um, and so from there, I was uh, first at a small startup doing virtual reality um, games and media. And then uh, from there, I moved on to doing DevOps at uh, a larger manufacturing company in sort of the HVAC manufacturing energy uh, smart building business in their IoT division. Very different types of companies, very different areas of focus, um, but also having to solve a lot of these different problems like how to release uh, faster, how to do things more efficiently, you know, how to reduce costs, how to keep everything stable internally, how to make sure we don't get paged at 2 a.m. to fix something that's broken or down. Um, and so those were a lot of the things that we were working on as in the DevOps space. One of the other really great things that I learned moving from this is um, going from that small company where, you know, you end up being kind of the lone ranger working on a lot of different things to being on a larger team where everybody is sort of working and collaborating together rather than things just getting thrown over the wall from the developers into the operation side of things, which is one of the great promises of DevOps, right? Um, so from here, I think you get a little preview. Um, the point is that this isn't a road that you have to walk alone. Um, you don't have to feel like you're, um, you know, the, the only DevOps engineer out there, the Lone Ranger IT, the only woman that is going through the things that you do, the only, you know, um, tech in the organization or engineer that's advocating for this change. Um, you know, this is a thing that we do as a community in that um, events like this are really great for it, to be able to come together and support each other. Um, so a little bit about just, um, you know, how we can continue to be here to support each other. Uh, you know, it's uh, great that we have this LA DevOps group. It's amazing that, you know, this is something that we continue even though we can't meet in person. You know, early on, there were various iterations of different LA DevOps groups in LA that I think were just really instrumental at being able to support and help encourage, uh, encourage me and make me um, feel like there was a sense of community out there. Right now, there are meetups that have transitioned to this online world, um, different Slack and Discord groups in the community as well, um, along with some different local conferences. And I also make a side note, conference communities, because there are some of these online communities where people can continue to engage since we can't really have these meetings in person right now. Another thing that I think is super critical is um, mentorship and being able to just, you know, highlighting what uh, Cynthia and Krishna have said is to be able to help support and uh, reach out to others that are working with us. Um, I had previously volunteered with Girls in Tech LA, which had done a lot of outreach and youth mentorship programs. There are some really great university programs there. So for example, the UCLA, their Society of Women Engineers has a mentorship program that pairs professionals with students. Um, and there are a few other groups where you can either on an ongoing basis or a one-time basis be able to reach out, give back, and help out to people that may either be getting started or maybe experiencing challenges that you can share um, support for. Kind of to tail off of that uh, idea of mentorship, um, there's also education, which I mean kind of goes hand in hand, but also looking at, you know, even younger ages, um, working with, with girls or youth that may be in, you know, anywhere from elementary school, middle school, and uh, high school, if you don't have exposure to things like computer science or engineering, it may be, and if it seems like this big mysterious or difficult thing, then uh, it just kind of reduces the likelihood that somebody might not be able to go in that direction. And so if you have a girl that does, never is exposed to technology or engineering or computer science, um, there's just less likelihood for that interest to get built up in thinking, well, this is something that I could do in my life, or this is a direction that I want to go. So a lot of that education is being able to help spark that excitement and curiosity. Um, and the last thing is advocacy. So just events such as this celebrating diversity, sharing narratives, um, creating community, working with programs at the office, 
I'm in just continuing to advocate and sponsor for, um, you know, women that are in technology in the workplace for um, those that are working with you. Um, I included a link down here to a resource guide that I've been developing that just lists out some different groups in uh, LA that encourage diversity, that uh, support and uh, work with women in tech. Uh, and uh, I think timing wise, I'm gonna have to blaze through this portion, um, but act two is the present and the future. So I've gone from kind of this DevOps world into um, working now more with customers and helping to solve the challenge and problems that they're um, experiencing. And what I wanted to talk about right now, as far as the future, um, is just some something that I've been super interested and excited in recently. Um, well, recently and for the, the past two years or so, which is um, Kubernetes. And so what I'm going to be talking about is just some fun projects that you can do to learn Kubernetes uh, and to do this at home. So I kind of split it up because there was no really clean segue. And I'm like, well, I, I really want to be able to share some of these things with you because um, it's just something that I find really exciting right now. Um, and if you jump on Reddit or Hacker News, there are tons of opinions about whether or not you should use Kubernetes for personal projects. I'm not speaking to that. It's more if you are curious and you want to learn more, this is just a path that you can explore. Um, so Kubernetes, as you will sometimes see abbreviated as CAPES. Um, basically an open source system for automating, managing container, containerized applications. Um, I'm sure that uh, a lot of you already are familiar with or have heard of this um, before. It's super um, hyped right now, uh, but basically just, I won't go into too much of the background and history, but it's, it's just basically, you know, uh, a way of being able to efficiently run and manage um, containers and um, you know there's been this this move to be able to work with microservices and containerized applications basically making everything a lot more modular and portable you get rid of a lot of dependency issues um, and kubernetes is a really great platform for being able to do that it's kind of like taking that big monster of a closet with a bunch of mess in there putting it in some tiny little uh, neat buckets so now you can work with everything a little bit more easily So I'm going to skip over a lot of the preamble. I've got links to resources um, at the end if you um, want to get any more background and are not familiar. Um, but as far as being able to try this, um, there are some resources and utilities where without having to install anything, you could just run everything in your browser, be able to test things out. Um, there's O'Reilly's Katakota platform and some other online labs and utilities that you can use to be able to just log in, run everything in browser, be able to get an idea, test, you know, test out some applications, get familiar with the concepts and so on. Um, next from here on your local system, if you wanted to start doing this in a dev environment, then you have a few different options here. Um, and there's some differences between each of the different options. A mini cube is kind of the fastest to get up and running um, but it is a lot of overhead. Um, Minikube and Kind are both Kubernetes projects. Um, they just differ slightly in their speed and the implementation on the back end of how you're um, uh, dealing with, with the nodes that you're running, um, but there are different ways that you can be able to run and start developing applications or testing things out. Um, on the other side of the thing, on the edge, there's also um, some of these other tools, MicroKates, which is from Canonical, who uh, is kind of the steward for Ubuntu, as well as K3S, which is from Rancher. And these are also some small light ways that you can start trying to run things within Kubernetes. Um, differences, those are um, lightweights, so they're kind of built for the edge, they're production ready, if you should so choose to go that route. Um, so from here, you know, there are a ton of tutorials online that kind of go into, well, all right, here's how you get everything installed and set up. But what next from there? Like, what do you do with this Kubernetes cluster that you have? Um, you know, what do you put on there? So there are a bunch of different useful projects online. Um, some sample websites like this um, super online boutique or this sock shop. Um, there are some different types of shops or book info sites and everything 
all of these which are available online with sample code that you can just deploy so that you can actually start using it. Um, and you know, if you wanted to have your own sock shop in the future, this is something that you could take. You've got all the templates ready there for you. Do your uh, side quarantine hustle. Um, so another couple things, uh, and as I mentioned, this is uh, experimental. So there are a lot of these really fun projects, but your mileage may vary. Um, you know, um, some of these projects are uh, are not actively maintained, but these are all like, and some of them are just sort of these proof of concepts, but they're also just sort of these really interesting things that you can do with the tech um, to play around with, just things to spark your interest. Um, so games. Within um, uh, this world, you have a few different games, mostly of the chaos shooter engineering uh, variety that uh, you can basically run and by deploying this game, you can actually interact with things that are in your cluster. So you've got this thing that's fun, like a Space Invaders or a Doom or this other, which one can help you, you test your cluster, but also you can have this up and running. Um, another really cool and fun project, which uh, even prior to uh, um, being set up for Kubernetes that was set up just for Docker is, um, you know, you can run Minecraft. So if you'd like to run your own Minecraft server and get this set up. There are a few different projects that you can get set up to run this within your local Kubernetes cluster. Um, there are a few other games. Um, this one is, is a pretty old project, but it was actually the sort of proof of concept of running in VR, which is a really kind of a interesting and curious idea. And then also your game of pods where you can, you know, conquer huge swaths of the map while playing this game online on uh, this code cloud platform. Um, from here, I also wanted to share a couple other resources just as far as learning. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of really great and fun illustrated guides out there um, that are available online, or you can even maybe find a physical copy, uh, get that sent out, um, that describe, you know, some of the fundamentals there uh, is, of course, XKCD, which if I'm doing comics, I always have to do a call out to because you've got a lot of really good and relevant and current uh, tech descriptions related to, to what I'm talking about. Like this one you hear is uh, on Docker. This is another one that's been making rounds recently uh, that, that talks about why, you know, having that good handle and eye on your dependencies and being able to decouple some of your infra is just might be a useful thing. There's another really great uh, collection of comics and books that are from Julia Evans here about containers and about some of the fundamentals within Kubernetes. Um, you also have Denise Yu, uh, where we can go from everything uh, from containers and virtual machines to a, a garden container in that same context. And she's got a lot of really great resources and material online that uh, have a sort of fun way of approaching and sharing some technical topics. Um, so I, I think I'm about at time. I, I do have a lot of resources and references here at the end. I was told these slides would be shared out. Um, but there's everything just depending on where you are uh, with that journey or, or knowledge here and what you're interested in. Um, some info about just the, the backgrounds and principles getting started. Um, links to all of the demo applications, um, the, the games that I've listed, uh, and then also uh, cats because, <laughs> because cats are amazing and there are plenty of cats on the internet. And so if you would like any additional prototype apps or maybe you wanna develop something that you can run in your cluster, there are actually a lot of different cat APIs available online where um, you know, you can send a post over and uh, get some, some cats back. So all in all, uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, you know, thank you for, for having me and sharing. I, I've really enjoyed hearing from uh, Cynthia and Krishna, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Heather as well.